Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's a pleasure for both of us to participate in this session. The session was originally uh, at 7 o'clock to 7.45. It's now moved forward. Um, so uh, I just will give a little bit of a context to it. The topic of the session is knowledge economy riding the wave of information age. Um, just to put the whole thing in perspective, knowledge economy refers to economy where knowledge is created, conveyed, used for the economic development, the accelerated economic development. And in that sense, in a knowledge economy, knowledge capital is at the core, meaning that the know-how of the uh, workforce, the ideation, innovation, and the professional skills are all extremely important. And why knowledge economy is important for us is because in knowledge economy, we have high value, high tech activities compared to our traditional background where we have low value, low technology activities were there. And typically in a knowledge economy, we use this word <clears throat> very often without fully understanding. And typically in a knowledge economy, uh, there are four drivers. It's a framework uh, which World Bank looks at whether uh, the economy of a particular uh, geography is not the economy. And there are four drivers. One, investment in education. Second, uh, the, the, one of the most important things about that is uh, having ICT infrastructure. And third is, sorry, actually the second should be innovation capability. That means innovation capability would refer to research institutions, universities, and the culture of innovation and the ecosystem. And the last and the most important one, again, relevant to our state in the context of Hartals, etc., is actually the ease of doing business. See, the business climate or the business environment is important. And why it is important is because all of these high value, high technology solutions that you bring, the actual putting to use or subscribing of the, the people subscribing that is when it is business transacted. Only then people use it. So therefore it's quite important. So this is the context in which we are going to have this discussion. And we should uh, look at where are the, where is the world, what is the global context, economic context the disruptive innovation context and the future of jobs as well. And then we'll talk about uh, what does it mean for us to ride that wave and what should be the stakeholders like job seekers, universities, government, entrepreneurs, what is it that uh, they have and they should be doing. So maybe I will pass it on to uh, Ajit uh, to talk more about the topic. This is the background, then this is what we will be covering. We will take questions from you towards the end. Ajit. Okay. Uh, let me first check if my voice is getting to the back row. You have? Okay. But my wife always says I speak too softly. She can't hear it. Okay. You know, and to, since all this is a lit festival, uh, I want to bring the context of what uh, VK just said into uh, something that all of you can relate to. If, uh, you, perhaps many of you are aspirant writers or you're already writers yourself of fiction as well as non-fiction. Let me start by making what may sound like a very dramatic statement. The bestseller best of the next five years will be something which can be read on a mobile phone and read within three minutes. Within three minutes, okay? That is a maximum attention span that people are, today have. So if you can write a really nice story, which can be read in three minutes and can be read on a mobile phone, you will get hundreds and millions of people to read it. My fond hope is 
the Kerala Lit Festival, three years from now, will be devoted to giving prizes to the best of that genre and not the fat books that you see shown outside here. Now, on what basis do I say that? I say that because, uh, look, I'm a great student of history, particularly of media. Now, if you look back when the first cinema was invented, it was partly in Italy and partly in the United States. And what they did is they went and recorded four to five hour musicals, which were done on stage. So when a new media technology arises, they go back and use the format of the earlier one. So the first films were four and a half to five hours long, till some bright people, including Hitchcock, leapt on the screen and uh, said, uh, on the scene, and I said, look, people are not going to watch anything more than one and a half hours to two hours. So that launched movies as we know it, and then it took off. Uh, instead of 10 people in New York and four in Florence watching it, tens of thousands of people, including all of us, would watch, have the patience watch a 90-minute film. Now, when television appeared, they tried to run 90-minute episodes on television and nobody watched it. So they hit the formula, which was a sitcom. A sitcom would be, you know, 20 minutes split into three episodes, split by ads, maximum 60 minutes, but each episode would be around 20 minutes. So looking at that history, I'm, I'm forecasting this. And also, I live in Bombay, and we're surrounded by Bollywood types of various kinds in our creative professions. And today, every decent filmmaker in Bombay is trying to create a feature film which will run for a maximum of three minutes. Maximum. I've seen some of them. First, when they brought it to me, I said, what is this crap? Can't be. But that's it. They said, Mr. Balakrishnan, you're known as a pioneer in technology. Give us a hearing. What do you lose? You lose only three minutes. I said, what, three minutes? How can you show me a film in three? It was gripping. They have created films for three minutes which can be watched on mobile. So, Remember, this is where the world is going. And in our, where will you watch it? You don't go to a theater to watch three-minute films. When you're waiting for a bus, you'll watch it. You, when you are waiting for an appointment with your boss, you'll watch a three-minute film. When you are in a train, or if you're lucky enough to have a driver like I do, I have a one-hour commute from Kolaba to Mahim where my office is, I could watch a film easily. So that's going to be the future. Hmm? Similarly, writing will not be a 300-page book. It will be a, if it's fiction, you'll tell that story in three minutes. Okay? So, all questions are welcome. Thanks, Sajid. I think uh, that's clearly coming to the uh, end outcome, you know, what the changes are going to be. I, I would like to probably now talk a little about, bit about what if you are an entrepreneur, if you are a businessman, if you are a student, uh, if you are a, a professional, what is it that we should be a little bit uh, concerned about or worried about? I'll tell you uh, some of the scenarios which will come out and very, very soon. For example, a very professional study conducted by McKinsey Institute of Management, Global Institute, is that across 2,000 activities in 800 occupations, so that means they conducted a study of 800 occupations and uh, 2,000 work activities across them, and they say that with technologies available today, technologies available today, 50% of all of that can be automated. Do you understand? 50% of all of the jobs. Actually, if you aggregate this, sum it up across the world, worldwide, it's about 1.1 billion jobs, adding to close to 17 trillion in wages. That means those jobs can be automated. I'm not saying it will be automated, it can be automated. And I will tell you some examples. If you really look at the banks, the retail banks, that where we go and transact, the, percent, the, the, the 
percentage of the occurrence of us having to go to a bank has come down. In developed world, I can tell you, 50% of almost all the banks, branches, are closing down. That means the so-called jobs that we were very secure and safe may not exist. Yeah? And the jobs which will go first are the jobs which are of three nature, which is repetitive and physical. That means physically you need people to, to do that, as in manufacturing. Second, jobs which involve data collection. Again, I'll take the same example of a bank, where you go to the bank, and across the counter you are talking to the lady, and the lady is asking you to fill up a form or whatever, it's data collection. And then this particular application or your form is entered into the system and it's processed, it's data processing. So repetitive physical, human, as well as data collection and data processing, these are the kind of jobs that will get automated. But the reason why they are not probably getting automated as fast as it can are because of three distinct reasons. One, the cost of technology itself for certain geographies. Social and political acceptance is another factor. And the labor dynamics which prevail in some of the countries where it is, for example, we have a lot of people to work, but we have few jobs, so therefore it may still be cheaper, though it may not be as productive and efficient. So this is a reality. If I take today the top 20 banks in the world and then arrange them in order, Wells Fargo will come in the number one position and Royal Bank of Scotland probably in the 20th position. But the payment services of Alibaba, Facebook and PayPal put together will occupy the 12th position, meaning that attackers are coming. So these changes are coming the future of jobs are phenomenally changing. Yeah, so it, and we should be, and as individuals, as professionals, as universities, academia, as well as government has a lot to do with it. You know, for instance, I can tell you how once upon a time we used to tell you focus on your core area. But the boundaries of businesses are blurring. I'm sure you heard about Amazon. You know about Amazon. Amazon came in as an e-tailer. It's a retail company, electronic e-commerce company. Today, Amazon is the biggest operator of computers. Today, Amazon is the biggest freight forwarder, logistics company. So once they establish the connection between the producer and the consumer digitally, they're able to enter in many different areas. Alibaba, you may not know, is the biggest you know, brokering shop in, in, in China. It's also Tencent and Ichiba in, in Japan. So these disruptions are very much coming. You've heard about 3D printing. Yeah? 3D printing. What is 3D printing? It is digitally enabled distributed smart manufacturing. Instead, I am able to control the manufacturing in Brazil from here. And why am I manufacturing there? Because it's closer to the customer. So I don't need to manufacture here and ship it. Now, that is what 3D printing. And if you go with that concept, that is digitally, electronically enabled, that kind of manufacturing, Adidas conducted a study. It's quite interesting. They conducted a study, and they were able to save through 3D printing, reduce the time, cycle time, from design to shipping from 18 months to four months. So there are so many disruptive innovations which are changing. Now, in other words, to sum it up all, the way we manufacture, the way we consume on demand when we want to consume what we want to consume, the way we distribute, the way we transact online real time, the, all of this is actually changing, is dramatically changing. It's an open, so we talk about knowledge economy and how we should be equipping ourselves. So I think it's important for us to know that we are riding that wave, but we are also riding a very uh, uncertain, it's a very unsettling one, but it has a lot of opportunity. I'll ask uh, Ajit to, to speak more. Yeah, you may wonder why my friend is discussing um, 
you know, banking and related things and what the process changes are going here and why I'm emphasizing strongly and predicting that the future Bollywood hit or even a Malayalam hit will be no more than three minutes long and will be watched on a film. There's a connection between the two. I'll tell you, what the internet does deeply is it drives, it brings into play three distinctly different forces, which once I describe it, all of you will recognize. The first one is called dematerialization. It is simple. When I was young, your age, I used to watch, re listen to music on uh, discs, really tangible discs. Then it became um, tapes. Today it's digital. So what one thing the internet does is deals with dematerialized things. Uh, it becomes digital. The second thing that it does is it, uh, it, it kind of disintermediates the chain. It's easy to understand. Today you buy a Chinese phone from Amazon or Flipkart as the case may be. Uh, it, earlier that phone would be sold to a dealer in Shanghai who would sell it to a wholesale importer in uh, probably Delhi, who would sell it to a Kerala distributor based in Cochin, who would sell it to you in Calicut. Now, in one shot, what Flipkart stroke Amazon have done is they have gone and done a deal directly with the manufacturer and skipped all those chains in between. And that process is called disintermediation. This is happening in media as well. Earlier, you used to have books which are sold to wholesalers and come to bookshops and then come to you. You can go and buy in digital form okay, and download directly and read. So it happens in all industries. And the third, third leg of all of this, which is perhaps the most important thing, is disaggregation. The first was dematerialization, the second was uh, disintermediation, the third is disaggregation. It's best understood taking a case that uh, my friend here described. Today you have a mammoth bank called HDFC Bank, okay? In 10 years from now, this it is extremely likely that it will be disaggregated into an independent company which does payments. Because somebody does takes deposits, still others will do lending, and so on and so forth. So what one big bank does as a whole will get disaggregated to independent entities. The entire fintech investments are going to disaggregate and destroy all these monolithic banks. So that disaggregation process, it's if, again, if you're writers, you have to see, when you write a story, and the story is, is, can, should be read in three minutes, if you have a this elaborate description of Kashmir, you'll probably hy hyperlink it. I won't click on it because Kashmir, I know what it is. But if you take some of my um, friends in Kannur, they have not been to Kashmir. So they, that story for them to understand, they have to click on Kashmir and see the context. So you can even create novels which are where some references you know, having written a book myself, you know, very often one, two-thirds of the book is provide the context of what you're saying. That may get happily. So all of that could happen as well. But do not forget it. Quickly go and create a three-minute film in Malayalam. I presume everyone here is a Malayali. And make it a hit. Make it a hit. That's where the future is. And it should be viewable on mobile phones. Huh? And the general finding there is if you don't capture the user's attention by the second one and a half minute, he'll close it. You know it, you do it yourself all the time. So success of the film, you must capture his imagination the first minute and watch, make him watch for three. What will be the economics of it? Very often it's likely to be subscription based. Today, uh, I also am a co-founder and own Rediffuge, a very big ad agency in Bombay. All our clients are coming to us and say, can you guys find us some mobile-based three-minute video where we can put our ads? They're all just lining it up in a queue in the rediffusion office saying, please, they say, Ajit, you are an imaginary guy. Find us somebody who will do a three-minute feature film where we can sponsor and put it our thing at the end. No? Okay. Yeah, very interesting linking that way. So, we, we talked about the, what the changes are and let's also look at what the opportunities are. If, I, if we, we were to be looking at the India story in, in, a, in a 
digital uh, world. The I can give you, talk about. We can see deficiencies, shortcomings everywhere, but all of that is an opportunity too. For any sector you take, for example, healthcare. We have, if you look at in India, we have one third per capita doctor for the population compared to even developing countries. And similarly, we have 35% less health workers in our place. If I take education, this is absolutely true. The latest statistics is 88% of our eighth class students in rural India there are some exclusions, four states are excluded, including Kerala. They cannot even read class one textbook. So 88% of rural India, excluding four states, cannot even read class one textbook. If you took an agriculture, 48% yield is less in India compared to Asian country economies. And even today, we have 20 crores, or tw sorry, 2 million, sorry, 20 million, 2 crores of grain wasted because we don't have proper warehousing. The, if you take the, the energy sector, 24% of energy is still wasted in transmission. So these are all, of course, housing, we have a lot of deficiency, but at the same time, all of this, this is on the demand side and this is the opportunity. So unlike in a developed economy where they have to really find how to increase your economy or the economic output, for us, these are all opportunities. And on the supply side, if I look at it, that's where you and me come into play. On the supply side, the biggest opportunity for us is our demography itself. The average age or the median age of India is 27 years. As compared to US, which is 36 and Europe on an average 43 and Japan 46. So we have a very young vibrant population and we are also because of all of the you know infrastructural issues we have we some or other have also a technology advantage. We have 1.1 billion mobile subscriptions. Last year 2018 we did 200 billion digital transactions you won't believe. 200 billion and it is expected to grow five folds digital transactions payments and buying a ticket online and things like that and it is expected to go five folds in the next five years reaching a trillion digital transactions it's a great opportunity and the internet penetration is a question of debate but still we say it's about 35 percent and we are reasonably tech savvy. Kerala, you know, now if you are coming closer to us, Kerala is pretty tech savvy, most of the people. And we clearly know the, the kind of productivity improvement we are achieving because we call up the driver and he's coming and all the optimization, you're going to the shop. So we have huge opportunities because we have a lot of shortcomings or shortfalls and we have got the technology one. And how can people bridge this and for anybody who is coming, and this is the beauty of knowledge economy, we should be able to, it's so much more easy in these days to come up with a business idea and translate it, at least to be used initially in the Indian context, because we have so many deficiencies that we have at the, at the moment. I think it's a, this India context is very important. Of course, there are many things that all of us should do. The, Professionals should do, the schools should do, the colleges should do, the government should do. So there are tremendous amount of opportunities for entrepreneurship. What's that? Is only five minutes left? Is it only five minutes left for the? Huh? Yeah. If it's only five minutes, then we can do Q&A. I think it says, I mean, five minutes more for this. Oh, OK, OK. Yeah, I, I think, um, uh, you know, in India, there is, you're all bright, young people. Uh, one of the things that I would urge you to look is as the internet 
it achieves better penetration and a payment systems improve. Uh, look for opportunities where you can be entrepreneurs. Don't line up for jobs. It's a complete waste of your life. That era is over. In India's organized sector is not creating any jobs. IT service companies are downsizing. But you have, as he pointed out, a very large young demographic market. We have, through the mobile phone, finally a way to reach them. And all you need to do is find imaginative services and the way you deliver them. One of the tips that I have is uh, look up Tim Berners-Lee and see, he is the original guy who invented the World Wide Web. Now, he says he's disgusted with the way the web is developed because it's just become a money-making racket where people subsidize and outspend each other and go to the top. He is proposed an architecture for what he believes is ought to be the World Wide Web where each person's data is kept by himself and never given to Amazon or Reader for anyone else. Look up Tim Berners-Lee and when you think of your entrepreneurial venture, architect your site, uh, which will be on a mobile, along those lines. Don't go back to the old-fashioned Amazon, Yahoo, Google. Even Google is old-fashioned. Because all of them will soon um, get crushed by the demand for privacy laws. It is, there is a tremendous wave coming, tremendous. I sit on a couple of government committees in Delhi. You would see the anxiety which even the Indian government, which has woken up very late, the Europeans woke up first. Um, hard. So I think look up Tim Berners-Lee's architecture and follow that and you will succeed. Yeah? Thanks, Arun. I, I, before we close our session and go into question and answers, I just want to, do you guys have, you know about artificial intelligence and machine learning. You have heard about it? Artificial intelligence? Some of you may be practicing too. So, uh, I'll give you some tips about artificial intelligence for the real world, yeah? Uh, and, and huge opportunity for our country. As an example, in artificial intelligence, even at the very lower level, it, at the supervised learning level, it is basically creating the patterns, yeah? In a bank, people apply for loan. For example, you apply for personal loan. And there's a lady sitting there and she's going through what's your salary, which company you are, what's your credit score, are you married, what nationality. She's checking all of this to finally decide whether you will pay back the loan. That's the point. And if you will pay back the loan, then they will allow you the loan. You understand? So let's actually look at if you go into that, it's a very emerging, lot of opportunity area. So there's an AI programming that we can do to look at the patterns. On the one side, you have the loan applications. The outcome is, will he pay or not? And this is a very simple one. And we have so many, we are talking about 1.3 billion people in our country. I'll tell you another application, if you ever want to be an entrepreneur in that side. So, think of a situation, we have, on our roads, on our roads, we have 10 accident death a day. In 100 days, in 10 days, it is 100 people die on our road, in Kerala, in Kerala. Some of them on the spot, some of them in the hospitals. And many of these accidents take place at certain spots and certain time of the night. If you study this, the question is, in artificial intelligence, quite like us thinking, you show 1,000 cases, and then you ask the system, 101th case, will it happen or not? And the system has good chance to tell you where it will happen. In the case of our new cars, or cars which are connected to the ecosystem, the question is, will this car hit the child? So it's happening in MG Road. Will it hit the child? And the system will say, yes, good possibility. We can actually feed it back to the car and the car will stop automatically. Do you understand? It is possible. For example, today, and to two, three areas, you know, the world is spending so much money on digital. Digital has three areas, artificial intelligence, it has another one, digital as in cloud and uh, conversational platforms and the ARVR, but there is one area which is very critical, which is about data privacy and cyber security. 
And this is one area which is huge, huge opportunity. Now, I can tell you another case where you can make an absolute success, and mo most of you can, is if you are able to come up with a scheme which will browse everything that's actually coming on the internet and will say, this is obscene, this is against the law in Kerala, and it should be removed. And if you really teach the system, the system will be able to do it. So there are so many opportunities, ladies and gentlemen. I, th I think for the interested ones, a lot of opportunities. As Ajit said, you don't have to go and take up a job with somebody. You will be able to create a job for yourself and for others. I think we are past our the initial 30 minutes, and the rest of the 15 minutes is for questions. One 30-second comment before I end. When you do something on your own, you must write code yourself. I spend four and a half hours a day writing code in R and Python. If you don't do it, you know what, shall I tell you something? To, you'll say, I'll give it to the tech guy to write. Outsourcing technology for an entrepreneur is like outsourcing sex in marriage. So just remember. Sir, what is the trouble with knowledge economy is that intangible labor is competing with tangible labor. That is robotic labor that is intangible. The, all the trade unions in bailed over is in a dilemma. They lost their, already lost their negotiating power because trade unionism is on the decline. Because intangible labor takes over tangible labor. So therefore, therefore Bill Gates recently banking for a robot tax to compensate job loss. So uh, it is part of CSR. And CSR is a farce, what we understand, because it is part of a finance capital agenda to yeah. cheat. Yeah. So what is your take yeah. on Yeah, so this is an, a very, very important and very uh, uh, concerning matter of this paradigm shift. The single biggest, the single biggest when we automate more and more and go in that path, there are good things and there are bad things. There are some good things I can tell you. I can have a robot in my old age who will converse with me for my comfort because there may not be anybody who will take care of me in my old age. And it may be great that I am able to make sure that the media is cleared of all obscene and abusive stuff. But the single biggest casualty, unless the government and all of us take care, is the massive job displacement. That's the single biggest pain point. Now, I, I still believe it is not more dramatic than the shifts that we had, economic shifts that we had, in the last several hundred centuries. For example, from an agricultural economy to a manufacturing economy, to a services one, to digital, to again the next level is, of course, it looks dramatic. It should not be dramatic. And the answer that you mentioned is, will the tangible workforce be paid from CSR? No. It can be done interim, but in my view, when the job of that bank clerk who is checking hundreds of application, loan application every day is now going to be done by a robot, which is nothing but code on the server. Actually, that lady, we are not creating, moving forward to make ourselves obsolete. As a humanity, as a community, we progress. And why do we automate? Because it's easier, that its quality is better, faster, cheaper. But we have to, so this is where governments have, universities have, companies have responsibility to make sure that we upskill our people to take on the new jobs that will emerge. For example, once upon a time, to be, if I have to marry my daughter to someone, I will look at whether the guy has the capability, the strength to work in the field, or even before, whether the, he has the capability to go and hunt. But today, we don't need. Later on, there was a time where the guy has the capability to add and subtract without making any errors. 
And even just 20 years back, somebody who is a document writer, his, he is selected because he can write, say, 20 pages without even one mistake. All of those jobs are gone. But new jobs are coming. More valuable jobs are coming. In the knowledge economy, that's what I st mentioned at the beginning, that is, we are, there is a shift from high value add, that means how economic output and high tech jobs. So the, your question is valid, but it is, a, it is something which we should answer, but we should not stand in the way of progress. Sorry, you also mentioned about road accidents. But recently, Google says that it will not be able to operate their driverless car in India and Brazil because of massive traffic violations. Yes. So artificial intelligence algorithms fails in India and Brazil because of massive corrupted violations. That's what true. algorithm will rep rep address that uh, bribe issue? I, 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 I will give you an answer to that. I'll give you an answer to that. I'm going to give you a choice. The, in, if you come to Bombay, there's an area called Bandra Kurla Complex. You have tall buildings there. X insurance company and Y. 20 storied buildings with, out of which the thinkers are about 10. About, there are eight to 10,000 salespeople making calls and selling. Now, do you prefer that Indians are given health insurance without any government subsidy, unlimited for 10 rupees a month premium, well, you can do that, or do you want those 8,000 people in Bandra Kurla complex to have jobs? You choose. I choose that 10 rupee insurance for all is better than hosting clerks for 8,000. And let me warn you, I'm from Kannur, so you, you don't be surprised. The Kannur guy should opposite, normally say the opposite. Yeah? Pardon me? You can, you can speak in Malayala. I'm not able to decode your English. No, 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 no. What insurance is too expensive in India, you know why? Because layer after layer of salespeople are employed in it. The actual valuation is, you know, I can teach you how to do that in a three minute class. It's been known since time immemorial. It's artificial is going to work on actuaries. But selling and completing and detecting the symptoms, insurance must be made very cheap. I'm taking one, one example. Today, less than 15% of Indians have health insurance. It's a crime. If a rickshaw puller in Calcutta falls ill, its family is destroyed. Just to keep 10,000 clerks in their jobs? No. I think we have to make sure that the rickshaw puller, whose daily income might be not more than 50 rupees, can pay 10 rupees a month insurance. So don't look at job loss by white collar people. Look at the benefit to our own citizens. So rephrase the debate differently. Uh, on a lighter way, the, uh, the beauty of artificial intelligence would be that when you are going and looking at an officer and ask the machine a question, will he take bribe or not? <laughs> the machine might say, no, please. Sir, uh, I have a question uh, here. Sir, I'm here. So, um, it, it, so far, good uh, if it's artificial intelligence, but uh, what if it's artificial stupidity? Who will take care of the, uh, the kind of losses, um, you know, or kind of uh, the confusion that it creates? That's number one. Number two, you said it, it's going to replace a lot of people's uh, job. Now, uh, wouldn't that also create uh, a disparity in income distribution? Because you can't gen um, distribute the income that is generated by technology. You, uh, technology cannot be rewarded back. It should ultimately increase uh, maybe the, the rich becoming um, you know, super uh, rich and uh, poor becoming uh, ultra super poor. So wouldn't that increase the divide of rich and poor? So um, the, what is the real issue? The real issue is that the kind of work that we do today will not exist tomorrow. And perhaps we will have a job displacement at a very fast pace. This is a concern not only for us, it's a concern worldwide. Today in the United States, actually 50% of all its jobs can be automated, which is a wage of 2.7 trillion. And they are trying their best to see how people, we create technology, we create future not for us to make ourselves redundant. You know, the human, we don't create it to make ourselves redundant. Except that 
peop there are uh, you, actually the people on the street as citizens we cannot immediately government has responsibility academic institutions have responsibility companies have responsibility that's what i said we really need to bite the bullet otherwise what will happen is quite like what is happening in brexit in uk the medicine is applied to the effect of the problem not to the cause see see that we should not i was actually talking to in in, in our it uh, interactions with the government that we should not like we opposed computers we should not oppose automation if we oppose automation obviously we will become less productive yeah so it is some it is a concern but this is something which we can address and that's what i the analogy i said previously from agriculture to manufacturing to services to it to digital we will cross this also successfully i'm sure so i have a question uh, you talked about the change in job market by the technological advance you know, by the artificial intelligence and things so how can the traditional education system can solve these problems and enable the future generation to address this kind of job market you know that is what i was answering it is the same thing yeah. i tackled this issue in the northeast not in kerala the number one goal if the kerala government has any sense in them is to update the curriculum in engineering colleges in kerala in polytechnics and itis the kerala engineering college curriculum is 15 years behind time i have yeah. studied it okay now you can you you and listen 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 let's finish so you know the best way you can do it is to make sure that the college curriculums are updated so that when you go into the job market you know the cutting edge stuff that is the way to do sir i also want to ask about the uh, mooc uh, revolution the massy open online course that app uh, uh, i want to ask about the uh, mooc revolution the massive open online courses that internet education changing online education uh, uh, there there's a revolution up, uh, happening in the education sector the mooc massive open online course so how can yeah. these change the traditional barriers and uh, okay. make the correction correction uh, moocs when they first the oom stands for massive online education in the united states when it started Uh, it was hyped up a lot about eight years ago, and I was an avid follower of that because I, I was M M H R, the education ministry was asked, was put me in charge of a committee to recommend. So far, what they have done has not succeeded. All they have done is they are taping lecturers' speeches and recounting it, so that only 10 percent of the class even gets it. But more developments are coming not through MOOCs, but U S Navy is doing a number of experiments which. tracks your progress and each student gets individualized attention to learn what he wants to do that again we very badly need to implement here all over india but since i am a malayali i said let's go and invent and do it first in kerala that's it. i think that's the end of the session